Yes, thank you. And uh, the subtitle, Turn the Black Hole Inside Out. The title is clear what these things mean. The last decades or so, I've been busy with two main subjects in my research. One is the title here, Black Holes and Black Hole Information. The other is the interpretation of quantum mechanics. You'll see these two topics coming together a little bit. And uh, my claim is you can't understand one without understanding the other. But some people will claim they do understand it and then they'll totally disagree with what I'm saying. So, um, of course, you're always allowed to shout at whatever I'm saying. And um, I hope that we have discussion will follow. So, um, our, one of the main problems that we're dealing with today is the question of reconciling gravitation with quantum mechanics. I use the word reconciling. I don't use the word quantum gravity because quantum mechanics is a way of describing things in, in, from our point of view. And gravity, of course, also needs to be described. We need the same language everywhere. So if matter is quantized, then we need the same language for gravity. Calling that quantum gravity is something of your choice. Um, now, one in, uh, finding which I find interesting is this, that normally when we discuss gravity, you start with Newton's law. And Newton's law is a law that tells you that the gravitational field spreads out in three-dimensional space and the field strength goes around the R squared. Um, that means that there's many try to switch on general relativity, you will encounter curvature everywhere in three space, or in, th in four space actually. Because it's, of course time is also there. So you have the curvature all in everywhere in space. And um, there is another approach which might seem rather pointless from this point of view, but I'll briefly mention that. Um, that is that you can also look at another phenomenon linked to, to general relativity, and that is the Shapiro effect. The Shapiro effect is that if you look at a star which is hiding behind the sun, just the moment that the, star, the starlight is grazing against the sun, you can only see that when you have a, a solar uh, eclipse, of course, but um, and the effect is, is always there, and that is that the signal is being bent over, which means in practice you see the star a little bit further away from the sun than it actually is. And moreover, and that's the most important fact for me today, there's a time delay. So light that takes a little bit more time to reach uh, the observer, so it gets, it gets um, redshifted and uh, while the star comes closer to the sun, and so on. So we, you see these effects, and altogether, I would indicate these as Shapiro effects. The Shapiro effect, however, that Shapiro effect acts in a two-dimensional space only, and that is because the image that you are looking at, when you look at it with a telescope at the star, you see the two-dimensional world. You see just a frame, and that frame is two-dimensional. And then there's time. So one dimension disappears, and that means that curvature now takes place in a lower dimensional world. That makes general relativity a little bit easier to handle, and that tells me that starting this effect might allow you to quantize this effect, which you're only quantizing some phenomena where two different screens touch each other. And that is relatively easier to do than having curvature everywhere in space time. So, this is a message that you can now uh, leave for whatever it is, and uh, I'll now address my problem. The problem is the treatment of, of black holes. So the question is, has always been for a long time, what exactly happens when a black hole absorbs something? And that the particle that it absorbs disappears, we can live with that. But a, 
particle also carries information. What kind of particle is it? What is the bound state? Is it a, what energy state is it? And so on. All that information seems to disappear as well. And this is something of a problem if you want to describe black holes just like ordinary matter. If I replace the concept of black hole with a bucket of water, I know that if I, if I pour some extra water in the bucket, the bucket will, look, will behave a little bit differently afterwards. Uh, and also, the water that comes out of the bucket and by precipitation, by, by um, evaporation, or by, uh, by freezing out, or by being poured out, all that depends on what you put in, and uh, there's an action equals reaction principle in this sense. So we, we would expect such a thing for black holes as well, but when you do your first calculations, you find otherwise. So when Stephen Hawking first argued that black holes must emit particles, he found that those particles do not at all, not at all, reflect the information that went in. So still, even though particles emerge from the black hole, they still don't carry the information that you would have expected to come out, like it does in the bucket of water. Of course, you understand very well, by pour, pouring water out of the bucket, you, in practice you don't see when it was being put in, or how it was put in, whether it still was water, or perhaps uh, loose atoms or something. This information you can't find. But in physical terms, you can always look at the Schrödinger equation for the system and solve it backwards in time. You can do it classically as well as quantum mechanically. But a black hole seems to be impossible to, uh, to integrate backwards in time because we don't know where that information then comes back uh, into being. So that's a problem that you have to face. And my claim is that if you do address this problem, it looks like you're addressing a minor feature, a phenomenon in, in the gravitational physics and not the whole problem. But yes, you'll hit upon answers that will tell you that something very interesting seems to be happening that will be playing an important role whenever you try to quantize gravity. Um, so now this, what you see here, is a, a space-time picture of a black hole being formed. Horizontally is space, vertically is time. And um, uh, these lines here show more or less equal timelines as an artist impression. This is not yet a very precise and defined coordinate frame you're looking at. But this is roughly, roughly how we imagine black holes to come into being at a point that looks to, as a complicated, most complicated point in this whole picture. It's actually nothing is happening in this point. So an observer will go straight through and not notice that anything is taking place here. But to find out how particles behave when they come out of a black hole, we have to transform from here to here. And since these orbits are behaving in a rather similar manner, that transformation means that particles here are quite different from what they were at this spot. At this spot, they were just virtual vacuum fluctuations. At this spot, they are real particles. I draw a blue one and a red one. But now, what I'll do next is I'll throw another particle in. So, <coughs> I'll just put it like this. This black thing is now a particle sent into the black hole. And what you see here is the Shapiro effect in these, these lines here, that the outgoing particles are being shifted about a little bit. For this particle, that's shifted rather insignificant. Also, this particle is. Also, for the blue particle, the blue particle was on an orbit further away from the horizon, but is being dragged towards the horizon. Okay, nothing happened with its information. But the red particle did something more awkward. The red particle was totally in, totally in the clear when we were here, but now I send you the next particle, earlier actually, and now you see that the red particle disappears into the black hole, its information is taken away. But now you see the information is taken away by the Shapiro effect, and not by Newton's law. If I can handle that Shapiro effect better, then perhaps I can understand what the hell that is information. I claim that I really can. And on top of that, you get insight that the ideas which I've been trying to <coughs> pursue the last uh, decades or so about interpretation of quantum mechanics, those also seem to make sense in, in this field. So things are coming together in a way that I find pleasant. Um, but um, now I'm going to go to business and I'm going to do some calculations. 
not all of them will be explicit, so that, that is how you just want to convey the message that yes, I'm doing calculations, but no, I'm not showing you, you literally what the calculations are. Here you see in the picture of an eternal black hole, the outcome particles that come out from here, and the internal particles that come out, they come in here in the future. And at this point, they cross each other. Now, um, I will claim that this is the most important region of the black hole, where the in particle and the out particle cross each other at some finite distance away from the horizon. <coughs> Um, what happens at the crossing is something very important because the only hope for information to be passed on from inner particle to outer particle is that it should happen right here. And now what I have here is the Shapiro effect. And this is that um, if you um, switch sides here. Oh, I'm not here yet to discuss the Shapiro effect, I just want to discussed now the coordinate frame. The coordinate frame for the eternal black hole is exactly the Schwarzschild metric. So the Schwarzschild metric has a time variable on which things do not depend. So the whole, this whole background metric is independent of time. But there's, of course, a, a, a line element in the time direction which is being shortened as the closer you come to the horizon. At the horizon, time stands still. This whole term, the dt squared, vanishes. Times on one a, 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 a coordinate at the horizon. So the horizon is at where r equals 2gm. This is the angular part, it's going to, all going to be very important also for our arguments. And this is a space like uh, uh, material. But now you see there's, there's a rather mild singularity at r equals 2gm, but only in the space direction. This singularity, however, is very important. It tells you that something is not nice with these coordinates. Omega, by the way, stands for the two angles um, on the sphere of one to these R and T coordinates, and D omega stands for the infinitesimal variations in these angles that you can consider by when you write down this metric. The horizon is the I used to GM, and uh, it's clear that you see just one horizon, this one just one value for R, where the mm, parties can go in or parties can go out. Now, um, I go back for a moment to this eternal black hole. You may ask, why did I leave out the point where the black hole was being formed? And that point lies far in the past. Well, out of my calculations, it will emerge later. So, a posteriori, you'll find the argument. A posteriori, it will be that the inner particles here, and the, upper, the inner particles here, and the upper particles here, will do something at this spot. What they do here is going to be very divergent if they are very far separated. The spot will be lying all the way here, and information will carry along from in to up right here. And that information comes from commutators, which are very, very big effects. So big that the early particles here are not at all orthogonal to the particles here, or to the latter one to the particles here. So, because of this lack of orthogonality, we cannot independently indicate which particles are sitting here and which particles are sitting here. So this method at this region of the, of the space-time is totally insignificant to us because we can't put any particles in unless the uh, commutators with these particles are being considered. So a posteriori, posteriori I'm justified to replace these black holes which have been formed in the past by an eternal black hole. It of course simplifies calculations a lot and the other, the other advantages of using a eternal black hole is that the whole picture becomes time translation invariant and also invariant on the inversion of time. If you turn time upside down, the in particles go out and out particles go in, and that's all. So the calculations that, that I will be able to do will, will be, have a very simple straightforward time dependence. So it is also a very big advantage to use this as a background metric. Okay, I'm going to use the word background method. That suggests that gravity is classical, but the quantum effects of gravity has to be inserted by also allowing gravitons to move in and to move out. And those gravitons are, of course, small fluctuations of the metric. So we get the quantum effects back indirectly from the gravitons. Um, I'm perhaps going a bit fast, but I, my time will be precious, and so I can't help it. So, um, uh, 
that this statement I was just talking about, that the uh, content is diverse so badly that I cannot put particles here or here, but the only particles in this direct domain here. And the claim now is that this way I'll get all states at the back hole. Because you can put a Cauchy surface here, and you can put whatever you like on this Cauchy surface, and that will determine everything that happens with the black hole. Except it will not determine what happens in the blue region, because the blue region cannot transmit information back into the active region, which is here. So this white region here is the only region where interesting physics takes place. But beware, some things will happen. Um, so this is the structure method. And um, now, because of the singularity at i equals to gm, to gm, I'm making a transition to different coordinates where that singularity is not there. That is a big advantage because then everything at the horizon will be just as finite as everywhere else. So I can use all the laws of physics at least to be able to calculate what happens at the horizon. And let's go to the Kruskal or Kruskal Sekeres coordinates or tortoise coordinates where uh, I replace i and t by x and y. The product of x and y is this function of i. The ratio, or the, the y divided by x, is this function of time and t. And then the, uh, the angular part remains the same. If you now compute the metric in terms of these new coordinates, you find this expression, and you find something rather really striking happening, that the singularity at i equals 2 gm which still was here in the transformation law, has now disappeared. This metric is right about all the way to r equals zero, without any glitch taking place at r equals to gm. So that's very important. I can now calculate things that have happened all the way to r nearly equals zero. r being zero is very singular. This is a very strange behavior at r equals zero. Fortunately, I don't need the region r less than 2 gm. I do need to know what happens at r equals gm. That's why it's very important to get rid of the singularity. They don't need to know what happens beyond it. Um, this, in this measure, you see, you see something else happening. You see that there's not one, but there's two horizons. One horizon happens at x equals zero, one horizon happens at y equals zero. Either x or y is zero means that this quantity here is zero, or r equals two gm. So the horizon of r equals two gm splits up into two horizons, the future event horizon and the past event horizon. <coughs> and uh, when a pattern goes from the future to the past, makes something, makes it, the story totally different. Um, but there's something even more important to remark about this, this metric, about, this, about these coordinates. And that is at every point RT of the Schwarzschild coordinates, and, and omega is not affected, so the angles remain the same. Uh, at every point RT, there are two solutions for x and y. How can you see that? Well, it's very easy. This is a monotonous function, so the product of x and y is fixed. And the ratio is also fixed. But if I replace x by minus x and y by minus y, then the product remains the same, and the ratio also remains the same. <laughs> so this whole expression at the right remains the same. In other words, every point of the Schwarzschild metric is associated to two, two points in x y space. And this is extremely important that, that black hole space-time becomes suddenly twice as big. Not just a little bigger as many people seem to believe. They say think that minus x minus y is some feature at the inside of the black hole. That's what you might think at first sight. If you look at it a little bit more carefully, you find that the space-time at x and, x and y both negative is exactly as important as the space-time for both x and y being positive. So, um, uh, so now I have to discuss what you'll see. The xy space-time is now going to look very different from the space-time in the Schwarzschild coordinates. The Schwarzschild coordinates are one horizon, one over two. And both horizons run from minus infinity to plus infinity, but I have a doubling of this quadrant. This diamond, this white diamond, is all of the outside world. So in fact, in fact everything I do with the black hole should take place in this white region here. This one is there for nothing, because only if you go faster than normal speed of light, you can reach into this diagram. By the way, this is a Penrose diagram, where light cones are everywhere oriented in the same direction, which means that, that here also the speed of light goes by 45 degrees. You have to go steeper than 45 degrees if you want to move from this point to that point. So in other words, 
you can't even get here. So this whole region is like for nothing, you would think. But um, now I'm going to use this to play my tricks with the Shapiro effect. Um, all these other water signals are right here. Um, so now I want to know what the Shapiro effect does, where these two particles meet. And what's happening? Ah, this is what I want. Uh, this is uh, the Shapiro effect, but now for particles. So this red line is a very energetic ingoing particle. This green line is a very uh, weak, uh, slow particle going out. So I'm in the, in the space time world's frame, in the frame of, of the green particle. The red particle moves very fast. It generates a Shapiro effect by dragging this particle along here. If I go to, uh, to the opposite, if I go to the frame of the red particle, you see the red particle being dragged along by the green particle. So both these things happen. So the in particle and the out particle are both, both affected and, uh, in, in this particular way. So what you want to know, is, to know now is what this does to the black hole information. <coughs> but you know, the, the answer will be I have to quantize this effect, to subject this effect to quantum mechanics. And the nice thing about it is that the effect itself takes place in a lower dimensional space-time than all of the quantum effects of quantum gravity. That helps me a lot in this sense. This Shapiro shift is a function, is described by, by saying how the light coordinate in the minus direction of one particle is affected by the momentum in the minus direction of the other particle. Because momentum is a source of gravity, and the gravity generates displacements, which are coordinates. So the coordinate of the of one particle is, a, is affected by the momentum of the other particle. And this function f is a Green's function, which happens to be a Green's function that obeys a Laplace equation in on the sphere where it is defined. So that's a two-dimensional Laplace equation. And that's what, since it's two-dimensional, it generates logarithms. And these logarithms then uh, are being fundamentally different <coughs> from the one of our square potentials that Newton was working with. Um, so, but you see something more important that the, um, oh, what I'm, I'm doing next here, and I'm trying to again save time a little bit, I'm not really not doing reading everything that's on the, on the screen. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm going to replace one particle in and one particle out by many particles going in and many particles going out. So now at all orbitals, at all uh, solid angles on the sphere, there are particles going in and particles going out. And they all obey the same Emmanuel Shapiro effect. They all have this effect. But now we have to add all the effects off. Because this is something very nice again about this procedure. This, this is a displacement. But displacement is independent from all the different particles. So it just adds up linearly. So this effect is a linear effect. You might have thought that these effects are very complicated. Think of Newton. Newton's force, yes, uh, when uh, you're subjected to general relativity, you get very non-linear Einstein equations. But here, Einstein's equations themselves still generate linear effects. So um, now I can co I can compute this Green's function by doing one very important trick. The same trick that you learn as undergraduate science physicists students, you learn how to do how to solve the hydrogen atom when you know the Schrödinger equation. You subject the wave function to an expansion sphere for harmonics. That makes life a lot easier in solving the, the hydrogen atom. So I do the same thing here. This green function that you just wrote down, which generally describes this shift, this green function depends on the angles, but in such a way that that equation obeys a Laplace equation. That Laplace equation uh, is rotation invariant. So because of that, the, the shift caused in the outgoing particle, generated by the inward particle, only depends on L and doesn't mix different L and values. 
So this is just the LM component, a given L and given, given M, of this displacement operator. But only one L and one M, and it is linearly dependent on P with the same L and same M. So you just have one variable ULM and one variable PLM in, uh, in the cycle wave expansion, and the shift is just a function of L. And it doesn't mix different LM values. That makes life a lot easier to do the calculations. But on top of that, you can do quantum mechanics, because now I'm going to put in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is that the, the positions of particles and the momenta of particles are not commuting. As we all know, we all know what the commutator is, it's just a data function. But now I put that back into my spherical wave analysis. And lo and behold, now the spherical wave components, the ULM and the PLM, are very similar commutation relations. And since U minus depends on P minus, and P minus is having a non-trivial commutator with U plus, it means that U plus and U minus are having this commutation relation. And now you see why this effect is, is invariant on a space-time flip-over. The U's and the P's are interchanged, but, uh, or the plus and minus are interchanged. But now you see if you interchange the plus and minus, you just get one minus sign in this commutator and that's it. So, and this lambda is just, in all long places, this simple function of the, of the angular momentum. Not quite an ordinary Laplacian, and that's because I'm, I'm doing this calculation on a sphere and not on that space. <coughs> Um, what you can say from this is that the u-coordinate for the upgoing particle is the Fourier transformation of the u-coordinates of the ingoing particle. <coughs> and I say, wait a minute, I thought in and out were independent. No, they're not, according to quantum mechanics. The out particle depends on the in particle by being its Fourier transform. And that's a tremendously important feature <coughs> and nobody pays attention except for me. So I think it's a very important observation to make. The different LM modes mutually decouple, that makes life very easy. So you only have to do the Fourier transformation in one dimension. You're everybody going to do a Fourier transformation in one dimension, it's just with the, with the square root of 2 pi and the denominator and so on. So it all works out fine. And furthermore, the, uni, the Fourier transform is, is unitary. That means that. Um, What, uh, what I wanted to say in the previous uh, transparency, I'll, I'll leave it in here for a moment. The Fourier transformation is, is unitary. That means if you take a normalized wave function in, you Fourier transform, you get a normalized wave function out. So the, so the norm of a wave function is preserved by the Fourier transformation. Now say the outgoing particles are the Fourier transforms of the inward particles, that's unitary. Therefore all the information out goes, of, of the in particles goes back into the out particles. Isn't that nice? Well, it would have been nice if it were correct, but it's not quite correct. Because I'm fully transform, I have to fully transform from minus infinity to plus infinity. So over this entire horizon, all the way from here to here. And then I'm, the Fourier transform is put on this horizon here. This is the, the uh, initial horizon from minus infinity to plus infinity. But that means that this domain is affected as strongly as this domain here. So I'm not leaving all the information inside this quadrant. Half of the information goes to the other quadrant. Still no conservation of information. I lied to you. But I did it also to make you feel happy for a few moments, and now you see all that's a problem. It's a problem because I'm affecting both regions of the of that wall. And this looks good. No press. all I think you That's it. Um, right. So, what I have to do is that this, um, that I don't have to make Fourier transform over the entire uh, real, uh, real line of minus infinity to infinity to plus infinity, I have to Fourier transform from zero to plus infinity. And uh, uh, zero plus infinity in to zero uh, infinity out. So the half line has to be Fourier transform to get another function on the half line. And that should be unitary. Well, it isn't. Because Fourier transformations are all unitary when they are on the real line. If you chop away half of it, you get a certain breaking down unitarity of the Fourier transform. But I can do something else. 
I can say, wait a minute, let's take only all weight functions which are even on, the, on this coordinate u plus. So take the function which goes from here to here, and the function from here to downstairs here <coughs> is the same function. Let's put that as a constraint, the even weight functions. Now what does a Fourier transform of an even function do? It becomes also an even function. So if I do this for the ingoing particles, the same will happen automatically for the outgoing particles. Uh, and, and that means that, that if I know it for one half of the real line, I know the, yeah, I get the other half of the, free, of the real line for free, and I know what it is. And both for the in and for the outgoing particles. Now I'm in business, and now I can use that to say that that preserves again the norm of the wave function. I leave a very solid expression to get to get a free transform over half the line. And then you work with cosines and sines rather than exponent, complex exponentials. It all comes up all right. Then, um, so that's the, the, the new trick that we have to use. So all the data in the region 2 have to be chosen identical to all the data in region 3, in region 1. That is what I what I can put from this. If I choose the data identical, then the wave function of half line determines everything. And also if I need the information from the identical, no information is, is lost anymore. I can put everything on one of these quadrangles. On the other quadrangle comes from three. What's, what is it on the other quadrangle? It's the same. Those two, those two regions are just describing the same space-time. As you should have known because the structure method is the same as well. So the particles I can put there are also the same. And that's the new thing. There's an operator k that, that maps me from region 1 to region 2. This k, the square of that operator is 1 because I do this, this interchange twice, I get back to where I started from. So, um, uh, yeah. this is my back hole. I, I took it with me because now I want to say something very important. I have a mapping. The mapping says that I map this thing onto itself so that now every point. On, on, on this part of the, of the, of the Penrose diagram has an, an associated point at the other side, it's the same point. So not only the point is the same, the particles here are also the same as the particles here. So this region is the same region as another region. And, uh, uh, and that simplifies calculation, of course, a lot. And This here as well. Oh, I have something to say, but I'm going to skip this part because I, I'm guessing that my time is going to pass. <coughs> but um, what's on this on this list here is um, an argument where I, in previous publications, I made a mistake. And the mistake was I thought that I had to avoid the cusp similarity that this might generate at the origin. <coughs> One way to avoid the cusp similarity is to put the other side to the black hole. So now. Uh, that is to say, I, I associated this operator k together with an antipolar mapping, mapping from a point to the opposite point in space time. So I said the region 2 here is mapped onto region 1 at the other side of the black hole. That was just a simple error. Uh, originally, I argued that it's, it's not so likely to be correct, but now I, I was not likely, it's just wrong. And that is because if I do this, then the manipulations that the calculations you see downstairs, which you don't have to follow for detail, will tell you that u plus and u minus will both go to zero if, you, if your L is even. But the even L expressions don't work. The odd L expressions leave you two possibilities. They don't put things on the other side, so they have too much information. The even L solutions don't have enough, enough information. But u plus and u minus are zero. That means that the expression for the accommodator head doesn't work. Because the combination between e plus and e minus is unequal to zero. So you can't have that, um, that both u plus and e minus are zero simultaneously. That is just wrong. So I have to give up the antipolar identification. But instead, I have to accept the fact that if I, if I close this thing, I close the other one to see that you see that. Yeah, at this point, something that looks like a cusp singularity. But all the mathematics is clear. So to do the mathematics, you just have to open the line. If you look, look at the solutions, 
You have to look at only those solutions for which the eigenvalue for the operator k is plus one. That means it was here is the same as here. But not only for wave functions, I can put an astronaut here, and then there also will be an anti astronaut at this point. And uh, thank you. Um, um, uh, again, I thought I had things right, but not quite, because I shouldn't replace the wave function like I had before. But in, 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 in the wave function is one, I should take this complex conjugate. Why? Well, if we look at this, at this diagram again, when time runs in the positive direction here, that same time runs in the negative direction here. So if you have a wave function psi, you will get psi delta here because it moves in the other direction. So psi here is not equal to psi there. I was saying before that this region is a clone, a quantum clone of that region. But they're not quite that because you have to make the complex conjugate. Complex conjugate would ruin my argument unless I do something about it. So the answer is well, let's now look at the interpretation of quantum mechanics. If you do that, you find that many of variables which are very much localized only have a finite energy domain. That's because they run in circles. And uh, the energy is finite. So what I'm going to do is the same solution that Dirac chose at the time when he wrote down the Dirac equation. He, he symmetrized, he put the origin of energy space in the middle of your coordinate frame, not at the very end. So you don't, don't say energy has a floor which is zero, and as infinity goes forever. No, energy has a floor and a ceiling, and the floor and the ceiling are equally far separated from the interior. Then this asterisk disappears, but you have a, 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 still a problem because the imaginary part of the wave function disappears. Well, then you have to understand what imaginary and real wave functions stand for. And this, the answer to that is very simple. A complex number is a, is a square, is, uh, it is a pair of real numbers. So let's uh, look at that complex wave function. That's just a wave function with two ingredients. That means there's a, there's a flip-flop variable that tells, tells you in, in, in which of the frames you are. And that <coughs> and wave functions do depend on that flip-flop variable. That is, uh, and then you get um, that, uh, that now the asterisk disappears and uh, or can be made to disappear. Again, at a price to pay, it means you can't use the global symmetry associated with complex rotations. And that means you cannot make the global, use the global symmetry to prove the conservation of barrier number or things like that. And um, um, my, my point is indeed, Long ago, I would argue that Barry number cannot be conserved by black holes. Because if black holes absorb particles, they can absorb as many baryons as they want. You can throw many buckets of water in a black hole, but you will only get the outgoing particles where baryons and anti baryons are equally, equally distributed because they, are, they have the same mass. So you can't distinguish baryons from anti baryons in the outgoing particles, but you can do it in the inner particles. That violates the conservation of Barry number. So, no big deal about, about this manipulation. It just means that better numbers are being lost. Um, and uh, so, when I use this uh, for calculation, I find that indeed uh, uh, information loss is, is being solved this way. Um, to go to the final point. So what I've, what I've argued so far here is that this region is the quantum clone of that one. If I know what happens here, I know what happens here. This is a very important piece of information. And um, uh, if you say that for simple wave functions, you say the same thing for, uh, uh, for more complicated objects, such as astronauts or in the particles for which the wave functions stand. So this is where I deviate from order and quantum mechanics. In order and quantum mechanics, you say, if you know the wave function here and here, if you even put the same wave function there, the particles may be in some other place, because it's the burn rule that tells you where the particles are. And maybe the wave functions are the same, but the particles are in different positions. No such thing in this picture. If the wave functions are the same, also the particles for which they describe the burn probability are also at the same spot. And this is where I deviate to all my quantum mechanics. That's a subtle 
interpretation point. If you do things right, that's what you get in interpretation arguments about, about quantum mechanics. And so now, uh, I have only five minutes. So I, oh, now we enter the discussion time. Oh, I need two more minutes, <laughs> because I have two more slides. And uh, it's about the whole temperature. I, uh, even, I was very hesitant to put this in my talk, because uh, I still haven't found a completely satisfactory way to formulate this, but almost. You know that um, the Hawking calculated the temperature of the Hawking radiation, and that temperature came out with this expression. But what he did was, he used the fact that uh, you, can run, you can read off the temperature if you go to complex time. If you go to complex time, then e to the i e t becomes e to the minus beta t, uh, minus beta e. And e to the minus beta e is thermodynamics, and that beta is the temperature. You get the temperature by looking at the periodicity in the time direction. But not, not in real time, but in imaginary time. So when in real time, you make a lower transformation. You go further, further on the horizon, and you come from the past to the event horizon. Nothing periodic. But in imaginary time, this hyperbolic lower transformation that you put at the origin <coughs> is replaced by just the rotation. And the rotation is periodic. If you rotate this over 2 pi, you get back to where you were before. So Hawking rotated by 2 pi, and you got this expression for the whole temperature. However, he apparently assumed that there's nothing, nothing uh, here that looks like what you have here. So he thought that if you rotate only the pi, you go from a point in the black hole to another point in the black hole, where all the data are different. For Hawking, these data here are no way related to the data here. But now I'm saying no. To, to explain how, how information is, is preserved in quantum mechanics, um, you need to say that the information here is the same as information there. That means if I wrote it over pi and not over 2 pi, I get to the same point in Hilbert space. In fact, that's what you have when you, throw, when you fold it up, you wrote it over pi and you get back at the same spot on the other side of the black hole. So, um, so Hawking had, shouldn't have used 2 pi, you shouldn't use pi. You find in all the books of Hawking radiation, you find his value for the temperature. But now I'm saying you have to multiply the temperature by factor 2, because the beta is the inverse temperature, and that is the periodicity in time for, um, <coughs> and for the rotations. The beta is a 2 pi that the Hawking arrives at in this calculation. But now, now I'm saying, no, you have to use not 2 pi, but pi itself. That means that temperature has to be divided by 2, uh, it has to be multiplied by 2, sorry. So the black hole temperature is actually twice as big as what everybody thought. Now I'm trying to defend that. Hawking was totally opposed. I, long ago I asked Hawking about, are you sure about your factor 2? And he said yes. And, uh, and, and there's no, there no discussion possible that uh, the temperature could be anything else than what he calculated. But now I think this argument about information preservation in black holes is very strong and should tell me that um, uh, that temperature is twice as Hawking thought. And not only Hawking, but everybody seems to get uh, this, this value that Hawking computed in my previous life. And now I'm, I'm here. So who is right? Hawking or, or I am or, uh, or whatever, or maybe there's another solution. We need to have a discussion. So I got some minutes away from the discussion. Okay. Yes. So, uh, thanks. Uh, Thank you very much for this inspiring lecture. Is your discrete symmetry K related to the CPT, to put it in more conventional terms, of your space time, or um, which that is violated because of the non unitary evolution? It is not quite that, but it, it contains complex propagation because, as I said, I go from energy to minus energy, I go from psi to psi star. So, yes, that is the C operator. Uh, it does not do. Uh, no, I think there's also actually uh, parity. In, there's time reversal, and there's parity. And, uh, if all is well, parity is also go to minus. But I think that's true. You can see it. Because of the actions that uh, yeah, 
So space, if you say space is distant time, is that and both space and time are changing sign. And, and also it's going from it's going away. So in a way, yes, it is, it, it, it may be the, the CPT transmission at this point. So Thank you very much. So keep us first, I think. Yes, uh, I thought so. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I have a quick question, maybe I missed something. But... Uh, uh, who's, who's speaking? Yeah, maybe I missed something, but uh, uh, I think there were some results proven in the 80s by Zurich and Wouters that if um, if there is no stochasticity and if there is um, no nonlinearity, the not clone quantum systems, uh, there's no go theorem with cloning, and uh, you just showed a mechanism in some ways in which uh, you cloned a quantum system. Wow. The clone here is a complete clone everywhere. So this product is the entire universe, and this is another entire universe, which, from my picture, is just the same universe. That's, I think, a different kind of cloning that people like Zurich have been looking at. Of course, I realize very well that cloning is considered to be forbidden in quantum mechanics. Well, it's forbidden to have a little region here that is a clone of a little region there in the same universe. That you can't have. But if you talk about different universes, then I don't think there's any harm on imploding everywhere here, it's everywhere here. Uh, no, don't leave okay. anything out, don't leave those assholes out, don't leave yourself out, uh, you will clone as well. So and, since uh, that I think is an exception, that's not a joy for the mind. I can add one question since you were short with your, with your answer, so, and what then we have to think about it. Thank you very much for the talk. I have really just a minor question. It relates to your, your, your mention that these position operators in quantum mechanics, I just wondered how these arise in special relativistic quantum theory we don't have position operators. Um, well, the in and outgoing particles, the radio component of the in and outgoing particles cannot be set and quantized. This is very important. It's good to ask because I didn't really mention that that um, the particles will be first quantized. They, they are only considered very, very close to the horizon, where for all practical purposes, they may be, may be considered to go with the speed of light. And in, in that case... Uh, there, there, are no, there is no first quantized position operator in special Then quantum. the operators you have to look at yeah, are the first quantized particles. Or you have to count all the particles that can go in. No. Sorry, the inward particle can only, at every L and M value, the inward particle can only go in at one spot on the horizon. Either here or here. So it's just one wave function, first quantized, which means I'm talking about one particle getting in, but only at one specific value of L and M. If they all the L and M values, then it is set quantized with respect to the angles, but not with respect to the I and T coordinates. So, the, the, it's indeed a problem because many people, including some of our collaborators, say, well, now I'm going to second contact and put all the different fields that you can have there. But that doesn't work. So, in other words, when I said that the standard model should be applied here and here, actually, there's a problem. The standard model is completely second contact, whereas the particles getting over the edge here are only first contact. So, that is still work to do. So, I have not finished the job. I, have to, I still have to understand how standard model here maps onto first contact systems on the horizon at every L and M. So that's a, that's a difficult question. So I think uh, there will be still plenty of questions, but that will be for the coffee break. So let's thank 